Hello. In the last video, I successfully restored an Amiga A590 drive to fully working order. But spinning discs are so last year, and these early SCSI discs just aren't made anymore. So, in this video, we're going to look at some alternatives to physical spinning drives. So let's start with an overview of some of the solutions currently available, and we'll start with probably the oldest, SCSI to SD. SCSI to SD has been around since at least 2011 as a simple way to replace a SCSI hard disk with a solid state alternative. Since that time, a series of different revisions of the board have been produced, starting with revision 1 which came in a kit form. The last version, revision 6, came out in 2021. It may have been one of the first devices of its kind, but it's not the only device available. Around this time, the blue SCSI version 1 appeared. Based around the STM32 Blue Pill development board, it started off life as a code fork from the Ard Scuzzino STM32 project. Much like the SCSI to SD, there's been a fair few revisions, including a version 2 which I'll come back to in a minute. Shortly after the arrival of Blue SCSI, in 2022 another alternative appeared, the Azul SCSI. In May that year, it changed its name to the better known Zulu SCSI, and due to the component shortage, the search was on for an alternative processor for these, and they released a version based around the Raspberry Pi Pico 2040 chip. Around the same time, the Blue SCSI version 2 came out, this one directly using a Raspberry Pi Pico board as its processor. The interesting bit is that the Blue SCSI version 2 code is based on the Zulu SCSI's SCSI to SD code, and the Zulu SCSI's 2040 code is based on the Blue SCSI code. Open source is great. Now there's one more device I want to mention. Originally called Ra SCSI and recently named to Pi SCSI, makes use of a full-size Raspberry Pi to do the grunt of the work. However, the Pi SCSI can do a lot more than the others. Not only can it emulate a SCSI drive, but it can also play host and include the ability to back up directly SCSI hard disks, providing full control via a web interface. The advantages of the Pi SCSI include its speed and flexibility, but given the Raspberry Pi can be a bit harder to get right now, and also has a boot time of around 2 minutes, it's good to know there's lots of choice. Now we've collected a few statistics about these, and they're very rough. The speeds vary depending on what you're trying to do and which system you're using them on. The prices are based on averages I've found around the internet, and some of them include currency conversions. And whilst this is all very rough, one important thing to note is that the latest generations of all these devices are much faster than their predecessors. And to be honest, the prices aren't that different either. So I've decided to try out the Blue Scuzzy version 2. Now from what I've understood, the Blue Scuzzy version 1 had some issues with the Amiga, but the version 2 is supposed to work right out of the box. There are several places I can order it from, either as a completely made up product or partially assembled kit, or a blank PCB, and I've opted for the partially assembled kit, so let's take a look. So in the kit you get a nice Blue Scuzzy sticker. Blue Scuzzy was originally intended for use with old Macs, so the sticker makes sense. We also get a mounting bracket. The main PCB, which I'll zoom in on so you can take a closer look. Also in the pack, we have a Raspberry Pi Pico that's already been programmed with the Blue Scuzzy software. It's really easy to update this in the future too. And that just leaves a selection of jumpers and sockets. So, let's put it all together. <laughs>
this inside my now working A590, but there's a problem. This accepts a floppy drive power cable, but the A590 uses a hard disk style Molex connector. I've looked around and you can get a Molex to floppy connector, but it's the wrong gender. So instead I've purchased one of these, and a small kit of plugs and sockets so I can make up my own cable. inside of the A590. Before we put the lid on the case, we need to sort out the SD card, and this needs formatting as either FAT32 or XFAT. Then, files can be placed on the card to represent a variety of devices based on how you name them. If the file name starts with HD, then it refers to a hard disk, CD for an optical CD, FD for a floppy disk, MO for magneto optical, RE for removable, and TP for sequential tape, not toilet paper. Obviously we'll mostly be wanting to use the HD option, but the CD option may come in handy too. Now each device on the SCSI bus has a unique ID number between 0 and 7. You can specify this as part of the file name, or if omitted it will default to 1. This is immediately followed by the LUN or logical unit number. Currently Blue SCSI only supports 0 for this value anyway. Lastly, you can force the sector size which defaults to 512 unless specified otherwise. Anything following these numbers and letters, perhaps starting with a dash, space, or a dot, or something else, is a friendly name for helping you to remember what the file is. Note that the maximum length of the file name must not exceed 64 characters. So how do we make these hard disk files? Well, actually it's really, really easy. On Windows we can use the fsutil command which can create files of any size we specify. The size is specified in bytes, so I'll use it here to create a file of 500 megabytes. See, it made it. Obviously if you create this directly on the SD card it will take a little bit longer. Now there's nothing special about this file, it's just a blank file, but it's the size we want. On Mac or Linux systems you can use the dd command to perform the same operation. I'm sure Google will help you with this. One last thing, I don't want to be constantly unscrewing the A590 every time I want to swap the SD card or change it. So I've got one of these SD card extenders. I've also bought a smaller fan, as the other one was quite noisy. You might think without the hard disk in there you don't need a fan, 
You probably don't, but I'd just like to keep those chips as cool as possible. Now I've also taken an ISO image of the Amiga OS 3.2 CD, and I've put that on the SD card too. Now I don't know if I'll be able to access it, but it's worth a try, and I've named it CD20 Amiga OS 3.2.ISO. But before I can try that, I need to update the Kickstart ROMs in my Amiga 500 Plus. You'll notice that if you look closely, the dreaded Varta has been replaced by a coin cell battery, and to the left, the four logic chips have been socketed. The Agnes chip and the socket has also been replaced. Thankfully, there were no tracks damaged. I need to temporarily disconnect the HDMI connector going to the RGB to HDMI adapter, so I can get to the ROM. And once removed, I'll pop in the Kickstart 3.2 chip. Make sure you align the ROM to the bottom of the socket. And once installed, I'm booting with a special disk that I've created that just loads the CD DOS driver. This boot sequence has been speeded up slightly. But once we get to Workbench, you'll see that the Amiga OS CD is showing up perfectly. This is going to make installing the operating system very easy. I've also copied the HD Toolbox app onto this disk to make things easier, although it is on the CD image. You'll notice here as I set up the drive, it's recognised as a blue SCSI Pico. I think that's kind of cool. I'm going to set this hard disk up using the professional file system. It's supposed to be much more reliable for hard disks. That strange code I'm typing in is actually the ID for the file system. When converted to ASCII, that actually spells PFS, with the last bit being the version number. Once we've made all the changes, I need to format the disk, and it doesn't take very long because I'm only going to use quick format. And with that complete, let's start the installation process, and I'm going to speed this up as it does take some time. And with the installation complete and no disk in the drive, I'm going to reboot the machine. Now the ROMs I've actually installed are actually version 3.2.2, so I need to apply all the updates as well. Now here's one interesting tip. We need to get the update files onto the Amiga, but there's around mm, 70 megabytes of data. Well, there's an interesting trick we can use to get that data onto the hard disk. The hard disk file that we're using in BlueSCSI will actually mount under WinUAE, which is perfect for copying files to it. It's worth noting at this point, I could go full emulation and install all the updates directly to the drive inside of WinUAE, but that would spoil the experience, although it would be faster. So now I'm going to install the 3.2.1 updates. And now we're ready for the 3.2.2 updates. And finally, the 3.2.2.1 updates. One nice thing I realised at this point is if I actually wanted to install all of the WHD load games or something else that's quite large, I can actually just create another hard disk file and then use that as another hard disk on the Amiga. I could then further partition that drive if I needed to. And finally, the A590 is booting perfectly with the new operating system installed, but there's one more thing I could do. Do you remember how in the first video the A590 was powered directly from the Amiga? Well, I could remake this mod, but I've decided not to as I want to keep it as close as possible to how it originally was. Now, I know this has been a fairly short guide to the Blue Scuzzy version 2, but there's really not much else to say about it other than, well, it just works. It's very easy to use as well, and I'm very pleased with it. So if you need a solid state Scuzzy alternative for your Amiga, the Blue Scuzzy version 2 seems to do the job very well. Now, there's one more video in this series that I may be making related to the A590. 
so if you don't want to miss that, make sure you've subscribed. I hope you found this interesting. If you did, hit the like button. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.